often it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Ethan Bash, who is an oncologist and director of cancer outcomes research at the University of North Carolina. And uh, I think we had our first exchanges one year ago or something like that. And uh, I, I was very nervous and <coughs> thinking, can we invite him? Will he come? And so, because we didn't know each other. And uh, well, here we are. <laughs> and I'm so pleased to have you with us this afternoon because uh, Ethan is really, uh, together with his research group, he established, and I think he was the first one to show Show this really in prestigious journals that nearly half of patients' symptom side effects go undetected during cancer treatment and clinical trials. And since then, he really tries to improve the measurement of patient reported outcomes. And he will show us all the project that he, he has been developing in the last years uh, to improve the measurement on one side, but also clinical care on the other. So I'm really pleased to have you with us this afternoon, and I give you this. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. And Manuela, I'd like to thank you for your kind invitation and for your hospitality. Um, I will be speaking today about patient reported outcomes, but because of the theme of the meeting, I'll try to add in some pieces about patient engagement and patient impressions of the use of patient reported outcomes in clinical care. Uh, and I'll also try to show a little bit of, of self-efficacy uh, that can be tied into the use of patient reported outcomes. So as background, symptoms are very common among patients who have cancer. I think probably most of us in this room are very familiar with this. And this is because cancer is very morbid and treatments can be quite toxic. Symptoms interfere with patients' physical functioning and can interfere with their daily activities. It can really globally affect how they live their lives day to day. And frequently, we know that symptoms that patients have during treatment with cancer lead to emergency room visits and to hospitalizations. And symptom management is really a cornerstone of quality care in oncology practice, and not just oncology, of course, and other chronic conditions, but particularly oncology. Those of us who are practitioners spend a good amount of our time thinking about symptoms, discussing symptoms with patients, and reacting to symptoms. So what is the standard approach to symptom monitoring and management in oncology today? Here on the left side, we see a patient who is experiencing symptoms that need to be communicated to his doctor and to his nurse. When the patient comes into the clinic for a visit, however, there are many hurdles that the patient has to get past in order to communicate his symptoms to the team. There may be limited time at the visit, or simply among the many other topics that we have to discuss at a visit, the symptoms may just be forgotten and then the patient may go home without that issue being addressed. Similarly, or even worse, when the patient is at home between visits, there are additional hurdles. The patient may be reluctant to call. This happens with my patients very frequently. They've been suffering at home after chemotherapy and they come in several weeks later and their husband or wife says to me, oh, it was terrible. The patient was in bed for a week after chemotherapy and I say, well, why didn't you pick up the phone and call or why didn't you use the patient portal to send me a message? And the patient will say, I didn't want to bother you. Right? And I say, well, of course, you know, please bother me. This is my job. But I think that there's a barrier to contacting the office. But it may also be difficult to reach us, and we know that it is not always so easy to get in contact with a doctor or a nurse. And these, these limitations or barriers prevent us as clinicians from being able to feed back and communicate with our patients and so I would call this a reactive approach. We're reacting to what the patients bring to us when they bring it to us, but we're not systematically monitoring how our patients are doing so that we can react in real time. So what is the alternative? 
The alternative is systematic symptom monitoring using electronic patient reported outcomes. For example, a computer system can send automated reminders to a patient via text messages or automated telephone systems or emails, enabling the patient regularly to self-report, for example, once a week, once every two weeks, whatever frequency is appropriate to the particular context. Alerts can be triggered to the providers when symptoms that are severe or worsening are reported by the patients, and longitudinal reports showing the trajectory of symptoms over time can be generated at visits as an impetus for discussion between the patient and the clinicians, therefore enabling better communication and connection between the patient and the provider. And I would call this a proactive approach, where we are systematically reaching out to our patients to let them know that we care about how they're feeling on a regular basis so that we can react to that information in real time. So Manuela asked me to include some parts in this talk today about the patient perspective on PROs. I actually don't generally talk about this. I, act, I don't think I've ever actually had this in a talk that I've given, but we actually do a lot of qualitative work in patients and with other stakeholders when we build and we implement these systems in order to help guide the design and the implementation. So I'm going to show you some data from patients who were naive to patient reported outcomes first, and then later I'll show you some feedback from patients who had already used the system. So uh, we conducted semi-structured interviews among 77 patients and their caregivers who had cancer, who were receiving treatment, who had symptoms, but had never used a PRO tool. And we did this at six different settings, uh, di different states in the United States, in both community practices and in academic hospitals. I won't belabor this, it's probably small for those of you in the back, it just shows the demographics. Uh, the take home here is that there is a good age and uh, sex distribution, um, and there was a distribution uh, between patients who had breast cancer, uh, GI cancers, so gastrointestinal cancers, genitourinary cancers, and lung cancers. We asked patients what their suggestions would be if we used patient reported outcome questionnaires. They told us, please make them simple and short. Please include skip patterns. So this was clearly a, uh, a technology avid population, at least some of the patients, who felt that we should allow uh, items to be skipped if they became irrelevant because of prior questions that were answered. They asked us to tailor them to the, the specific characteristics of patients based on their cancer type or their therapy type, something we actually don't generally do in our studies because it's technically quite difficult. They asked us to offer in multiple languages, to administer it electronically rather than on paper, although I think paper can be quite effective sometimes as well, to please link this to the electronic health record so we don't ask duplicative information. This is, as many of you know, quite a challenge these days technically, and we can talk about that a bit. And there was concern that older patients may have technical difficulties, which as was shown in a prior talk, uh, is generally not the case. That has not been our experience either. Actually, older patients uh, tend to actually have very limited technical difficulties uh, with these systems. Their perspectives on the potential benefits of patient reported outcomes was that this could be helpful, especially in the first few visits when it's unclear what to expect. It could be useful as a record of previous symptom scores to track their own progress over time. It can support conversations with providers and can show the oncology team how difficult life is with cancer. And I'll show you a, uh, an amusing quotation about this on this slide. These are some example patient quotations. This would be useful to help doctors and nurses help me manage my symptoms. It would be useful as a 30 second summary. If you have issues, you can go deeper. More than anything, so that doctors and nurses understand symptoms I'm experiencing to validate that what I was going through was really shitty. That means really bad. <laughs> the first couple of times you go in, you're still kind of new to this. It would be useful because you are still in that phase of not knowing what to expect. As you go on, what's useful is more about discussing either increase or severity. We also asked patients about disadvantages of patient-reported outcomes. The, disadvantage, the disadvantages, some felt, were they would rather talk to the doctor face-to-face -face about their symptoms. 
They felt it could be duplicative and that providers already ask about symptoms at every visit, which actually our empiric evidence shows is, is not the case. Generic forms would not address all the concerns, some felt. We may get tired of filling out forms with the same questions every week. It's not that helpful if I don't have many symptoms. And experience of symptoms are subjective and dependent on patient personality. There's some truth to that, but not as true as many uh, might think. Here are some quotations. To me, it would be useless. I'd rather just talk it out with my doctor. Face-to-face -face communication is a normal thing for me. How do I know the doctor will read the questionnaire? <laughs> the forms are very generic. Filling it out every time seems like a redundancy. Now again, these were patients who had never used the system, so we'll then see in a few minutes what the patients who used the system felt. So what is the prior research on patient reported outcome implementation in clinical practice and oncology? Well, as Manuela uh, already mentioned, uh, my group and others have shown that clinicians are unaware of about half of our patient's symptoms. We simply don't know about them, and as a result, we can't react to them. Systematic symptom monitoring with patient-reported outcomes has been shown to close this gap. It can, it can make providers aware of these symptoms, and I'll show you evidence of this in a little bit. Patients are willing and able to self-report, and clinicians trust the patient-reported information. These are some early data from my group uh, that were published in 2010, where we longitudinally tracked clinician-reported symptoms and patient-reported symptoms simultaneously for up to several years during active cancer treatment. And what I show in these curves is the cumulative incidence of the occurrence of symptoms, and I show it for six very common symptoms in oncology. And the orange curve shows the cumulative incidence of patient reporting, and the blue shows the cumulative incidence of clinician reporting. And that space in the middle is what we miss. So that is the opportunity that we have to inform clinicians about the patient experience, at least from the patient's own perspective. This is a screenshot of a very early patient-reported outcome system that we developed uh, more than 15 years ago. Uh, I was just having a discussion with uh, some, some investigators in the back and saying that we developed these systems before iPads and iPhones, before there was a term e-health. So we built this system. Actually, I had this system built for me by the people who built the financial and payroll system in the hospital. Uh, and they loved this project because they became very engaged uh, with a clinical project, but every time the payroll system went down in the hospital, they would disappear completely, and I would have no technical support. Uh, but it was a wonderful system, and we administered this to patients using uh, these very old-fashioned, gigantic tablet computers that many of you may remember with, uh, with the stylus pens that we used in waiting rooms. Um, and patients could also do it from home. Some of the patients did have internet when we started. And the early questionnaire that we used was an adaptation of what's called the CTCAE. For those of you who do cancer clinical research, this will be a familiar to tool. This is called the Common Terminology Criteria for Adverse Events. It's a very large library of adverse event terminology that's standard in cancer clinical research. And we essentially created lay, uh, lay terminology or verbatim uh, conversions for patients to use. This is a legacy questionnaire system for us. We've gone on to develop other questionnaires with the National Cancer Institute that I'll allude to briefly at the end of the talk. But this is what it looked like. And so here a patient might report grade one or mild pain. And then that patient might go on and report grade three or severe shortness of breath. And whenever the patient would report um, a severe or a disabling symptom or a symptom got worse from a prior time, it would trigger an automatic email alert that went to the nurse who was assigned to that patient. Uh, this is an example again. This is a very early symptom, a system probably about 15 years old now. But these emails simply went to the nurse showing what the new symptom was where it had been previously, and then had a link so that the longitudinal report could be viewed. 
And then this was a very early type of longitudinal report, in this case using a tabular form uh, that was chronological, showing all the different symptoms, and then the numerical grade, and then we would show uh, when chemotherapy occurred, which was pulled from the scheduling system. And then it would show changes over time up here. So uh, one of the early questions that we were interested in was whether it was feasible to implement these kinds of tools for patients to self-report, because at this time, most of my colleagues were highly skeptical uh, of this kind of work. Most of my physician colleagues felt that we as doctors knew better than the patients how they were feeling. Um, and also, even those doctors who felt that there may be some value of patient-reported information felt that patients probably would not be willing or able to self-report because patients are ill, patients may be busy, patients may have many other things going on in their lives. So this is the reason that we should report for our patients because, you know, they have other things that they're worried about or they're just too ill to do it. So this was uh, one of our feasibility studies. We've actually done many feasibility studies uh, across the U.S. And this simply shows that up to the 40th visit of patients over a several year period of time with, uh, with patients reporting both from home and from clinic, that on average between 75 and 80 percent of patients will self-report at any given time. And this includes both computer inexperienced patients, shown in blue, and computer experienced patients. Now in clinical trials, which I'll talk about in the second part of my talk, this is actually much higher. But in clinical practice, this is actually pretty good. If done well, this is the kind of compliance that you can have from patients. So, uh, so this is the other qualitative information I alluded to. We went then to patients who had been using patient-reported outcomes to communicate with their providers over time. And we went in and asked them what their experience was like, and we can compare this to what the prior patients I described uh, who had not used the system felt. We found, oops, we found that 98% of patients found the system easy to use, most found it useful, they thought it was easier to remember symptoms at their visits. It improved discussions with the doctor and nurse. A little bit fewer, but still, most patients felt an improved communication with the doctor and nurse. Most said they'd like to continue using it and would re recommend it to other patients, and that it improved the quality of their care, although you'll see 65%, somewhat lower, felt that it improved the quality of their care. And I think, you know, it may not be the most appropriate question for patients if something improves the quality of their care. They may not be in the best position necessarily to answer this, but nonetheless, I think that this is food for thought that many patients were unsure about this. Here are some example patient quotations for them, those uh, who use this system. And this is drawn from a cohort of about 600 patients. And these are really reflective of overall feelings. I feel that it was easy and convenient. I like the email reminder. Uh, in these, many of these studies, we sent email reminders to patients on a weekly basis to self-report back to us. Normally, I'm not comfortable with computer use, but felt, uh, felt like this system was very easy to use. Please let the patient keep it after the study is done. That was nice. But there were negatives. Make the computer faster. Uh, you know, many of these studies that we did were in, in the early days of wireless networks. We did these at clinics in many different locations around the U.S. where, the, you know, the network speeds were slow. They had early wireless networks, and so there was a lot of equipment unreliability. The patients did not like that. I mean, nobody likes that. Make the questions easier to understand. You know, these early verbatim translations of the CTCAE were, were a little bit uh, clunky, and so we've sin since changed the questionnaires we use. Some of the questions are too repetitious. And they also gave us suggestions. The system should include open-ended questions or a comment area. This was an incredibly common comment that we got. We gave structured questionnaires with about 12 very common symptoms, and um, in most of these settings, we did not uh, allow for free text. Since all of this feedback, we now allow uh, free text, open comments for additional symptoms to be added in, in all the studies that we use. And in some of them, we have, um, we use um, approaches where we then will structure the patient's responses by mapping to an existing terminology. 
It would be easier to go from tablet to the forum with no sign-in or password, so people didn't like having to use passwords. So since then, we've uh, sent, we, when we send the reminders, we have a link for the patient that goes immediately into the questionnaires. It would be helpful if doctors, nurses reference the PRO information on my next visit. This speaks to a very, important, uh, a very important issue, which is that if the doctors and nurses are not noticing or reading the information or feeding back to patients, the patients quickly become frustrated and feel that it's a waste of their time. And so a, a big part of the implementation needs to be engagement of clinicians to make sure that the PROs are integrated into workflow in a way that is organic or makes sense for that practice and that the providers, particularly the nurses, are partners, active partners in the implementation. Otherwise, this will not happen. We also have collected clinician feedback in many of our studies. This is just one example. This was an email survey of 27 physicians and the nurses who worked with them in one of our large studies. We found that 90% of them said that they discussed PRO reports with patients. Uh, they felt that PROs accurately reflect patient clinical status. Patient reported outcomes are useful during treatment for adverse event monitoring. And patient reported outcomes are a potential source of research grade data. So there have been a number of studies, not just those by my group, that have looked at the integration of symptom questionnaires into clinical practice. This is a systematic review that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2014, um, in which uh, it was concluded that integration of electronic patient-reported outcome systems in oncology care can alert clinicians about symptoms, improve communication, and improve symptom control. And this is a nice reference for those of you who need to be empowered by, uh, by data. <clears throat> and Manuela, am I speaking too quickly or is my pace okay? That would be wonderful, thank you. Right, yes, I know. <laughs> See, I didn't need a PRO for her to be empathetic with me. Thank you so much, to nursing, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. This was a wonderful study from the Netherlands that came from uh, Aronson and Detmar, published in JAMA in 2002, uh, where uh, patients were randomly assigned either to usual care or to completing a multi-symptom questionnaire on paper prior to visit. So this, again, was one of these early studies. It was before we had really um, seamless electronic interfaces. So the patients used a scannable paper form that was then fed into a scanner and then generated a report that was also given on paper to the clinicians at the visits. And, uh, and what was found is that this intervention uh, caused a statistically significant difference in clinician awareness of patient symptoms. The clinicians were simply more aware of, this, of the symptoms and symptoms were discussed more frequently. A very simple study, but a very important study to show that by integrating the patient reports, it would actually change the dynamic of the visit. It would improve communication. And that is important because that is, in fact, the intervention. This was a study by Galina Velikova from University of Leeds in the UK, published um, also in the JCO in 2004. Also a really lovely, simple study. Uh, this was a little bit more advanced. They put computers into the clinic, and when patients came in, they could self-report their own symptoms. In this study, it was also a patient-level randomized study where patients either had usual care or they would self-report common symptoms, and then these reports would be shown to the uh, providers. <coughs> and this study showed uh, that symptoms were sig statistically significantly more frequently discussed during visits, that this significantly improved health-related quality of life among the group that self-reported. So this goes a step further, right? So we know from the first study that there's communication and discussion, and now we know that quality of life globally, a clinical endpoint and a global endpoint that's probably related to overall function is being improved through the implementation of the PRO. So I became very interested in the impact of patient-reported outcomes on clinical care, and so my group conducted also a patient-level randomized controlled trial in which we randomly assigned patients who were receiving chemotherapy for metastatic breast, lung, genitourinary, or gynecologic cancers at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to one of two study arms. <clears throat> 
the intervention arm enabled patients to self-report 12 common symptoms, both at the visits using either computer kiosks or tablet computers, and weekly from home by computer if the patient had internet access. For those patients who had home access, home access they received a weekly email reminder to self-report. Alerts were triggered to nurses like the one that I showed you earlier every time a severe symptom or a worsening symptom was reported. And then longitudinal reports like the one that I showed you were printed and given to the nurse and the oncologist at visits. And the control arm was simply standard care. The way that we do things, the patient can call the office, we can discuss it at visits. We, tr we, um, we um, kept the patients on the study throughout their entire cancer treatment course. So patients went off of study at the complete discontinuation of cancer treatment, or if they voluntarily withdrew, which was very uncommon, but it did happen, or if the patient died or, was, uh, or entered hospice care. And we measured a group of outcomes, which I'll now show you. <clears throat> I need my, my water. We enrolled 766 patients between 2007 and 2011 and conducted our overall survival analysis in 2016 with a median follow-up of seven years, at which time two-thirds of the patients sadly had passed away. These are the patient baseline characteristics. The average age was in the early 60s. A little bit more than half were female because of the breast cancer and gynecologic uh, cancer cohorts. Uh, there was a good distribution among cancer types. And uh, we had a good distribution among, uh, of um, educational levels. Unfortunately, our educational system in the United States is not quite as even-handed as yours in Switzerland. Uh, and so in all of our studies, we find that there are a large number of patients who have high school education or less. That is a reflection of the United States. That's my side commentary. This shows the quality of life result uh, for this study. We assessed quality of life at six months compared to baseline, and we found that compared to standard care, 31% more patients in the PRO arm, the self-reporting arm, had significantly better quality of life, and this was shown both by 16% of patients having improved quality of life and here, and 15% um, of the patients uh, having less worsening of their quality of life. We also looked at emergency room utilization. You know, in the United States, there's great interest in keeping people out of the hospital and out of the emergency room. And this is the kind of outcome that catches the information, the, the interest, particularly of insurance companies. But of course, it's also a very important uh, patient-centered outcome. And what we found that compared to standard care, 7% fewer patients in the PRO arm, PRO arm visited the emergency room with durable effects throughout the study. We then looked at overall survival, which was perhaps the most striking result in this study. And we found that compared to the usual care, the standard care, median overall survival was 5.2 months longer among the patients in the self-reporting arm, 31.2 months versus 26 months. Uh, and this remained significant in our multivariable uh, analysis. And this translated into a five-year absolute survival benefit of 8%. Now, when I presented this study uh, at, the, uh, at the big American cancer meeting, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the discussant um, on, uh, who uh, came after me to speak to the trial uh, from, from Canada uh, noted that this survival benefit is greater than all but one of the cancer drugs that was approved last year by either the FDA or the EMA. So an impressive survival benefit for a simple intervention that's not quite as toxic as many of the drugs we use in oncology. So a question that many people have asked is, well, what is the potential mechanism of action? Why is it that simply asking patients to report their own symptoms and conveying that to nurses and doctors can have impressive clinical benefits? And so the potential mechanisms of action include that proactive monitoring can prompt clinicians to intervene early before symptoms worsen and cause serious downstream complications. 
And the evidence from this trial and from other studies we've done is that nurses take action in response to almost all of the patient-reported outcomes, the severe or worsening symptoms. In this particular study, they responded to 76% of those by calling patients and by, uh, by offering counseling, by prescribing supportive medications, and sometimes by bringing them into the clinic for evaluation. And we know from the data I showed you that patients, in fact, were kept out of the emergency room, suggesting that we were able to act early before patients wound up having to go in for care. Symptom control enables patients to stay more physically functional, which is known to be associated with better survival. And in this trial, compared to standard care, self-reporting was associated with better physical functioning and better self-care through tools that we administered during the study. And third, symptom monitoring enables control of chemotherapy side effects, enabling more intensive and longer duration of cancer treatment. And in this study, we found that compared to the usual care, patients who self-reported were able to receive chemotherapy for two months longer on average, right? So 6.3 months versus 8.2 months. Now, you know, usually when we do palliative care studies, we're interested in getting people off of chemotherapy. But in fact, in this study, what we find is that by controlling symptoms better, patients can stay on chemotherapy longer. So it may be those benefits of cancer treatment that are translating into some of the benefits we see. So my summary of the use of patient-reported outcomes in routine care is that the integration of PROs into care is associated with clinical benefits. This approach can be considered for inclusion as a part of standard symptom management to improve and measure quality of care. And future efforts, I feel, should focus on strategies for implementation, for integrating self-reporting into workflow and into electronic health records. This slide shows our next generation of systems that we use. This is the web system that was actually designed by a very fancy New York human, what they call a human factors firm. All they do is think about how things should look. They don't test things, they just think about it. But these people, you know, develop the logos for big companies. And this just shows that we use automated telephone systems, so voice interfaces very commonly now. We find that about a third of patients prefer to use a voice interface rather than a visual interface. This shows the kind of um, longitudinal reports that we now use in most of our studies where we show changes over time, uh, but we graphically show um, changes and these can be dynamically changed on, on the screen. Uh, these are small, I'm not meant, not meant for people to read them, but just as an example of something similar to what I know many of you are interested in and what I know Manuel is very interested in, which is the use of symptom management pathways. So in our newer studies, we integrate symptom management pathways along with the patient reported outcomes. So whenever a patient reports a symptom that's worsening or is moderate or severe, the patient receives a, symptom, a very simple pa symptom management pathway tailored to that symptom that they can see immediately. Um, and so this is the patient level um, symptom management pathway, which is just one side of one sheet of paper and we can give it in a PDF or an HTML. Um, and then this is the, the um, really the nursing or clinician level pathway, which is tailored to the severity. So there are actually different recommendations based on the different severities of the symptom. Uh, and these are all you know, based on uh, existing guidelines. So what is our ongoing research? So we have a national US study uh, that's uh, funded by PCORI, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. This is a large cluster, cluster randomized trial across the United States, both to replicate um, the results that I just showed you, but also uh, a major focus of this is around barriers and strategies to implementation within, uh, within clinics. And there are resources available to those of you who would like to do this in your own hospital system or clinic. Um, these are both from the International Society for Quality of Life Research, ISAQUAL. There are two different user's guide. The one on the left is a user's guide for implementing PROs within clinical practice. And then the one uh, on your right is a little bit more rec recent, and it speaks specifically to the technical considerations when integrating electronic patient reported outcomes into the electronic health record system that's being used. So uh, with the time I have left, and uh, you told me I was being timed. How much time do I have left? Five minutes? 
Really? Oh, I thought I had a whole hour. You, no? <laughs> what? No? Can I can have 10? Okay, well, I'll talk fast. I'm from New York originally, so I can do that. Okay, not too, sorry, translator, not too fast. In the next nine minutes and 45 seconds, I'll speak about how this integrates into, uh, into clinical research. So this is the problem, because it's not just in clinical practice that symptoms are important, but in clinical trials they are too. This shows a table from the drug label for docetaxel, a very common uh, chemotherapy that I and probably many of you use all the time. And this is the list of adverse events in the drug label. And more than half of these adverse events are symptoms, right? So, and many of them are very, very subjective. Nausea, taste disturbance, dyspnea. These are experiences that the patient knows best. But in clinical trials, oh, the head got a little cut off there. But in clinical trials, this information is not reported by patients. This information is reported by us, by clinicians, through processes where a lot of information we know is lost. So uh, one of the questions that I was interested in is whether the clinician reporting of this information is reliable in clinical trials, because if not, then the clinicians should not be reporting this. And so uh, my postdoc at the time, who's now faculty at Sloan Kettering in New York, did a very elegant study where uh, he noticed that patients coming in in clinical trials for their treatment were seen by two different clinicians, one in the clinic and one in the chemotherapy area, who both used the same tool, the CTCAE, to grade the symptoms of those patients. And that information went into the medical record. He simply looked at the inter-rater reliability, shown here with the interclass correlation coefficients, which you can see are quite low. For clinical trial grade data, we would want these numbers to be probably in the 0.8 range for reliability, but they are much lower than that, suggesting that if I and one of you saw the same patient at the same time, we might tend not to give the same grading. And that raises question about the information that regulatory authorities see when they evaluate the risks and the benefits of treatments. So then we became interested in feasibility in clinical trials, and we did a large national study where we integrated electronic patient reported outcomes alongside nine multicenter clinical trials and found that the majority of patients are willing and able to do this. This shows at the very end of the studies where patients were coming off of treatment that the compliance goes down, but in general, this is pretty good compliance, probably better than the clinician reporting. We, this I'll skip in the interest of time, but it simply shows that collaborative approaches can be used where the patients can report, and then a computer interface can be used where the clinicians see what the patients reported and then can agree or disagree with the patients, so we can become more aware of what our patients are reporting, and I'll skip these in the interest of time. Based upon this work, the U.S. National Cancer Institute became quite interested to create a patient-reported outcome system that could be used across all cancer trials. Um, and this was to become called the pro-CTCAE, the patient-reported version of the CTCAE. And so my group developed this for the National Cancer Institute over several years under um, multiple contracts. And our goal was to develop a robust questionnaire system that patients could use to create software to administer it and to implement it in U.S. multicenter trials. We analyzed the CTCAE, which is a library of adverse event information, which includes 800 adverse events in it, and found that about 10% of those items were appropriate for patients to report. In fact, 78 of those. We developed generic item structures, and then we created them, starting with this, which is the clinician CTCAE. This shows it for mucositis. You can see very complicated anchoring criteria for each grade. And we made it simple. We asked patients about the severity of the symptom with a simple verbal response scale and about interference with usual activities. For some items, we also ask about frequency, depending on the symptom. We conducted national cognitive interviews among patients to make sure that people understood the items well. And we conducted a national validation study and found that at the individual item level, these items were highly reliable and valid based on multiple different anchors. I'm gonna show you a very quick example in my last, what, maybe three and a half minutes? Two and a half minutes? <laughs> 
Four minutes. All right, there you have it. This, was, this is an example from one of the many studies. There have now been more than 200 uh, industry and public trials that have included the pro-CTCAE. Uh, but this was a trial of cabozatinib, which at the time was investigational, versus mitoxantrone and metastatic prostate cancer. The investigators showed, chose 10 pro-CTCAE items from the overall library. These were reported by patients every three weeks between visits electronically using a handheld device given to them by the company. And they found that an average of 96% 96, 96 compliance at each visit uh, occurred, uh, which is very high compliance. And this just shows you that same kind of symptom or, or adverse event um, table that I showed you originally for docetaxel. This shows you the clinician report. This shows the patient report for the investigational agent cabozatinib compared to the control mitoxantrone. And this just shows for a number of different symptoms or what we call symptomatic um, toxicities or symptomatic adverse events. There's really not much of a difference here with the clinician reporting. Even when we see a difference here, it's not statistically significantly different. Look at the patient reporting. First of all, it is much more common for the patients to report these symptoms. And for four of them, there are highly statistically significant differences between the arms. The precision of the tool is better when the patients report because they know what they're experiencing best. This shows the way that we can use this information. These histograms show the frequency of mild, moderate, severe, and very severe anorexia at baseline at every three weeks throughout the study for cabozatinib versus mitoxantrone. Number one, we see that most patients come into the study having symptoms. The clinicians don't pick this up. So this would inaccurately be attributed to the drug, but in fact, the patients had this before they came in, and we see this very commonly. But look at cabozatinib, right? The anorexia gets worse. There's much worse, or there's much more very severe anorexia by the end of the study in this arm. In mitoxantrone, it actually, right, it actually gets better. But according to the clinician reporting, there is really no difference. But this is a very big difference in the patient's view. This shows the National Cancer Institute's uh, website where you can download the pro-CTCAE for free. You can use this in any of your trials, either in routine care or in clinical research. So in conclusion, patient self-reporting improves symptom monitoring and outcomes in clinical practice and in clinical trials. It expands our understanding of the patient experience with cancer treatments and engages patients in research and in their clinical care. And Manuela, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ethan. And it's really my fourth. I thought you have an hour. It's and okay. uh, I got it wrong. Um, but nevertheless, we'll, we'll take some time for questions. Yeah. Because I think there are a lot of questions. Um, if there's not a spontaneous one, I have, of course, a question. So uh, what, what we didn't discuss so much today, but um, we worried a lot when we, when we prepared this symposium, is um, the, 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 the safety of the patient also, because it, it, it's very private data that are transferred. And um, what, what are your, so what, what are you doing? Because you, you're doing national studies, you provide this to many different settings. So how can you make sure that nobody gets access to this data that could then detect that someone has a cancer and not employ him anymore? Or, you know, so yeah. this is very serious issues, I, I guess. So could you just reflect a little bit on that? Sure. So there are different ways to do this depending upon the setting. In, in studies when we want to have very simple passwords, which many patients want, uh, and there are, is a lower level of security precautions, we have unidirectional information flow. Patients can report in, but nothing gets reported out. Mm -hmm. And so even if somebody gets the patient's password or they hack in, they can't see anything because all that's happening is that the patients are, are reporting. And when an email goes out to the patient as a reminder or a telephone call, there's no identifying information about them or, or their condition. So the worst thing that could happen would be somebody would steal a password and enter the wrong symptoms. 
right, which you could correct. Now, a problem with that is that patients then can't use the system to view their own symptoms over time um, because we want, a, we want active engagement. In those situations, we have to use a higher level of security, either more complex passwords or it needs to be linked to a patient portal system, which is part of an electronic health record, or we have to use secure messaging. Um, but you know, those, that, that's the reality. You know, we, we can't have a risk of a PHI bre breach uh, because you know, I think that we're at the very early stages of this field. And what we really do not need is to have a major information leak that would make, that would be a, uh, it would be a real setback yeah. for the field. So the way that we deal with this is that is one direction of information okay. usually. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? or critiques or ideas that you would like to share. Sie dürfen das natürlich auch auf Deutsch machen. Thank you Ethan for a great talk. I would like to go beyond the technology and ask you what is needed when you have a good tool that it works. We talked in the back a little bit, you said it today again. Email alerts that patients remember, feedback to the patient by a structured way, engage nurses, engage doctors, they learn. So could you also, what you said before, that you classify in direction of healthcare professionals, for example, small clinics, bigger clinics, how they work together. You talked about integration workflow. So could you tell us a few secrets? If you have a fancy, nice tool, what is needed that it works? Absolutely, and those user guide documents that I showed you from Isoqual actually go step by step through many of the things that you need to think about when implementing. I'd say a few things. You know, I, I think that um, you, it's a mistake simply to try to start using the tool. If if you simply try to get patients to use the tool and you send, you know, a, a young research assistant or a young you know, administrator out into clinic and try to sign patients up and give them passwords, it will fail. Uh, there will be very low compliance rates because this is a tool that needs to be a part of how we provide care. It needs to become a standard part of the workflow for the nurses and doctors and for the patients because it needs to be a part of what the patients and nurses and doctors are talking about. So the very important first step is to engage the clinic. And every single clinic needs to be engaged. So if it's in a big hospital, you need to go out to each clinic and find usually nurses who will be champions or advocates who can help you to figure out how best to train the patients and engage the patients and how best to train the nurses and the doctors and engage them. And this should take some time. You really need to sit down and talk with people. It's like anything. It's like when the electronic health record system is implemented. A lot of effort and energy goes into this because it's a change in how we do things. I think an important message is that we really aren't changing care, we are enhancing care. Symptom management is something that we do all the time. We're just trying to make symptom management more efficient, more accurate, and, and improve its quality. But there are several things that you can do. One thing is that when the patients are being trained or educated how to use the system, the, that should come from somebody in the clinic. And if the invitation comes electronically, it should be a letter from their doctor or from their nurse. If you have a, a technical person who's going to train the patient, they should be introduced by the doctor or nurse so that the patient knows this is part of their care. And the message should be given that we feel as providers that this is important. We'd really like you to do this and we're going to pay attention to this. This will help you and this will help us. But then over time, I think it's very important to monitor compliance, both compliance of the nurses and compliance of the patients. And this is a common thing that we do with any kind of implementation. It's something that we do with quality improvement projects, and this is really no different. So there should be a systematic monitoring of patients, and the patients who are not doing it, somebody should reach out to those patients and ask the patient, why didn't you report? Are you okay first? Were you too sick to report? Or if you didn't report, why didn't you? And to give the message that we feel this is important and we, we would like you to do this. 
Similarly, if there are clinics where we find that the nurses or doctors aren't really using the information or aren't really training the patients, that's, that is an important time to intervene and to go into that clinic and talk to people about it and see what their feelings are about it. And there will be patients who don't use it, and there will be doctors and nurses who don't, and that's fine. But we find that when a letter goes along with this, or an introduction from the doctor or nurse, our compliance goes up by 15%. We find that when somebody calls a patient who is not reporting, and we do that regularly, compliance goes up by another 10%. And so we actually have empiric data to show that doing these things improves compliance. Okay, I think there was another question. You showed us that the survival over long term was improved by after introduction of the, uh, the feedback. Um, and I was wondering if there are also economic consequences of this introduction of the feedback. Maybe it is more expensive or is less expensive because maybe the care was less intense or more intense. Do we have any data about that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you. You know, we in our national trial, we've included uh, uh, prospective economic um, endpoints uh, in it. We did include the EQ5D uh, in the trial I showed you, and so we did find, not surprisingly, that there, you know, that um, there was significant improvement in qualities with the PRO, um, which is not surprising since both quality of life and survival improved. Um, we did not do micro-costing or formal economic analysis. We do know approximately the cost of development uh, of the system, which was low. It was a couple of, hundred US, couple of hundred thousand US dollars, which we measured based on the time of the, of the technologists. Um, we also measured the duration of clinic visits and the number of nursing calls to, as a surrogate for time, and we found that there was no significant difference in the duration of clinic visits, and there was no significant difference in the number of calls between nurses and patients. It's just the, the calls occurred earlier, but the actual, the absolute number was the same. But we didn't do a formal economic analysis, but uh, based upon that, uh, it would be highly cost effective, you know, in the range of probably about 200 US dollars per quali, which is cheap. Yeah, now I think that the more modern, the more contemporary approaches, because it was at a single center where we knew the clinics well, I think would be much more expensive. This is because uh, you would either have to develop or license a commercial. PRO product that would likely need to be interfaced into the electronic health record, which is quite expensive, and then the training of the patients, you know, in multiple locations, if it's a multi-center implementation, I think would be much more expensive, and that's why we're doing the, the cost analysis now. Okay. Thank you very much. So, we have a little present for you, and Thank if you, you pronounce it right in German, then you can come back next time. La <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your excellent talk. Thanks.